give praise and glory to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bless your name, Jesus. And all how we praise you, Lord, for this glorious privilege that you've granted to us on this morning, on this day that celebrates, calls to remembrance, 
the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We want to thank you, Lord, for having put it in our hearts and minds that while others are celebrating Christmas in so many different ways, that we have come to praise you for the true meaning of what this day is all about. Bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, we ask that for these few minutes that we'll be before your people, that you will anoint these lips of clay, allow us to speak as an oracle of Christ and not just a man. If you would hide us behind your glorious cross, cover us with your precious blood, allowing no flesh to glory in your sight. Whatever you do, Lord, we'll take no credit, but we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor through Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise, everybody. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you may be seated. It certainly is my joy and happy privilege to greet those of you who have come on this morning uh, to celebrate the Christ of both the manger and the cross. I so often say that uh, I don't ever want to get stuck too long at the cradle uh, because the cradle only represents uh, the method through which the Word of God entered this world. Uh, but it was certainly at the cross where he purchased our salvation. So happy today for all of the Lord's people who are present, for many of our members who are out of the city that come in at this time of the year. And I better not start calling names because I just might get in trouble. I'll see some and miss some others. I'm certainly glad, though, to have a longtime friend and associate and fellow uh, brother in the ministry that we kind of grew up together in Detroit and he just across the river in Windsor, Ontario, Canada. And we're so glad to have with us today uh, the Bishop Clarence L. Morton. Bishop Morton, God bless you. Won't you just stand that they might see you? Amen. One of those preaching Morton brothers, uh, brother of uh, Bishop Paul Morton and uh, Bishop James Morton. And uh, also his wife, who is a daughter of this ministry, Sister Yvonne Adams Morton. Sister Yvonne, won't you stand, Sister Morton? So glad to have them with us on today. I'm going to go immediately into the Word of God. You know, I want to deal a little bit with uh, a text, but then I want to get to another part. Uh, I think it might be that uh, second chapter of Matthew where when the wise men came, they presented him gifts. And uh, I have a gift that I want to present and I believe that there are others of you that have a gift to present. Uh, and that to me is really the way uh, the world celebrates Christmas by giving. Amen? So we're not going to just come in today and sing and shout and go out the door. We're going to celebrate by giving. But instead of just doing as the secular world does, giving to each other, we're going to give to the Lord. Now, how do we give to the Lord when there is no golden or silver stairway by which to ascend up to heaven? Well, he left his body, which is the church, in the earth. And the closest you can get to anyone is their body. Amen. Amen. You've never seen the real me, and I've never seen the real you. Because the real you and the real me, we are spiritual beings living inside of the cage of the body. But the closest you can get to me is my body. So since you cannot get to Christ who is the head, you can get to the body because you're part of the body. 
And when we meet together as the corporate body, uh, then this is when we do for the Lord, when we do something for the corporate body. The Lord has blessed and Temple of Deliverance uh, is a world-renowned church. And the Lord has blessed us with a tremendous facility. And I said uh, at the beginning that we want to see this facility paid off in five years' time. Amen. So you see where my excitement is today. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. In Hebrews chapter 10, we'll begin reading with verse 1, and we will read down through verse 10. You did bring your Bibles, right? Amen. Now, don't forget, this is Christmas Day. But this is Saturday. Amen. I, I see a number of our people who worship uh, just at White Haven. This does not affect White Haven. I'll see you at 8 o'clock in the morning. And then those of you who worship here at 11, I'll see you right back here at 11 tomorrow. Amen. I just, just thought I needed to tell somebody that I was getting some vibes that somebody was thinking that once we finish here today, uh, then tomorrow is just a rest day, kind of a reverse uh, worship on Saturday and rest on Sunday. No, we worship today and tomorrow. Amen. All right, God bless you. Now let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. And if you would read with me the first 10 verses. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers barren too perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not neither had its pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. All right, we'll stop at this point. But I want you to look at verse 5, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. All right. I want to talk to you today briefly about a body prepared to save me. A body prepared to save me. 
I think you didn't get the picture because if you really got the picture, you'd already be giving God praise. A body that was prepared to do what? To save me. Amen. Now that's really what Christmas is all about. It is about a link in an eternal chain, a link that God prepared not to be the whole chain, but just a section to bring about God's plan of redemption for mankind. From the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, as it is recorded in the book of Genesis, and when Adam, by disobedience, and that is the key word to original sin, so many people try to go back and put it together in their mind as to what they believe man's original sin was. It does not matter what the act itself was. That which made it sin is the fact that it was disobedience. God said that you can eat of every tree of the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That particular tree, you are not to touch it. But the very tree that God said don't touch was the tree that they touched and therefore it became an act of sin. Not that it was an Adam's apple, an apple being the sin and it got caught in his throat so man has an Adam's apple. That was not the sin. I do not believe that the sin uh, was that of uh, man and woman uh, cohabitating in the sexual act. I do not know what the sin was, but I do know that based upon disobedience, God cast man out of the Garden of Eden and man who was created to live forever. Believe me, the very body that we live in this body was initially designed to live forever. The fact is that Adam did live to be 930 years old and Methuselah lived to get 969 years old. And the body that God made from the dust of the ground and breathed into it the breath of life was designed to last forever. But because of sin, God allowed disease to enter into mankind. And once man became no longer the holy, perfect, upright creature that God initially made, there had to be a way for man's sins to be pardoned, there had to be a way for God who is holy to continue to deal with man who had become corrupt and sinful. And God himself made the first prophetic utterance when he called the woman in and said to her, from this point, childbirth will be through labor pains. And no longer, even though you were taken from the side, from the rib of Adam, no longer can you claim co-equality because your desire from here on out shall be to your husband and he shall rule over thee. I said that a few Sundays ago and remind you that I didn't write the letter. I'm just the postman, so don't get angry with me. God created headship. Amen, brothers, anyhow. 
So having sent forth into the universe a prophecy from the Father himself, hell was alerted that one day one is coming forth that will bruise the serpent's head. And don't you know that once hell was put on alert, all kinds of roadblocks were thrown up. But from that moment, God started to prepare a body through which he himself could come down and visit man. I used to think about that, God preparing a body, and we think about Mary, the virgin, that brought forth Jesus. And although she was an innocent young girl who had no sin in her life, but in the lineage of Jesus, there was a lot of confusion in his ancestral line. And I have come to recognize in reading the genealogy of Christ that the prepared body of Jesus Christ was really prepared in such way that nobody could feel left out. Turn in your Bible just a moment to Matthew chapter 1. I'll show you what I'm saying here. Matthew deals with 42 generations from Abraham down to the birth of Jesus Christ. And God prepared the body because you got to understand that now medical science has advanced to the extent that your DNA can even convict you of a murder of someone else if they don't have anything but just the slightest drop of blood, or the hair, or anything where they can type your DNA. And Jesus coming through this ancestral line beginning at Abraham and coming down to Joseph. There is so much involved in the preparation of his body. Understand, as I said earlier, that once the Lord said that the seed of the woman was going to bruise the serpent's head, hell went on the alert. And God does not know, or rather, Satan does not know God's entire plan. And just like he didn't know God's entire plan for Jesus, he does not know God's entire plan for your life. So many times we think of the devil as being omniscient, as though he knows everything, but only God is omniscient. Satan doesn't know everything. That compounded word, omni, meaning all, science, meaning knowledge. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. He is present everywhere. And he is ubiquitous, meaning he's present everywhere at the same time. Only God has the qualities of omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence, not the devil. And this is why when the Lord has promised to do a work in you and he's spoken to your spirit and told you what he's going to do for you, you don't wake up telling the devil how bad you feel and how I doubt it and I wonder if this can happen. You just come on in the door. The devil may be pounding your head, but you come in shouting anyhow. God had a plan. Verse 2 in chapter 1 of Matthew says, Abraham begot Isaac. But do you realize how long it took? 
Isaac was a very important link in the chain of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And the man Abraham was 75 when God called him. And he was 100 years old before Isaac was actually born. Abraham went through some changes. He went through changes, and I know that the book of Hebrews said he staggered not at the promise of God. And he didn't stagger, but he fell on the ground laughing. Sarah laughed. Sarah even said to Abraham, said, I'll give you my maid Hagar. Young Egyptian girl, she'll, she's strong. She'll bring you a child. Let that be the child. But God's plan was not through Ishmael. His plan was through Isaac. So Isaac is born, and Isaac begets Jacob, and Jacob begets Judah. Judas, as it is called here, and his brethren. But when you look at verse 3, it says, And Judas begot Perez and Zara of Tamar. Now, here's where you first see a little bit of corruption seeping in the, our Lord's DNA. Why would I say that? Because even though we talk about him being the lion of the tribe of Judah, the name Judah means praise. And you think of Judah as always being something holy. But you read the 38th chapter of Genesis and you'll find that Judah went into Canaan and first of all, the thing God did not want him to do, he started cohabitating with a Canaanitish woman. And she bore him a son by the name of Ur, E-R, another one named Onan. And what does the Bible say? I know we live in the day when we say God doesn't kill anybody, God doesn't do this. You read the 38th chapter of Genesis, and it tells you that Ur was so evil that God slew him. <laughs> and when no child had been born to Tamar, Judah tells his youngest son, Onan, you go in to Tamar and let her bear you a son but the son will be credited to your brother, be seed to your brother. And what does Onan do? Because he knew that the child would be credited to his brother, he spilled the seed on the ground and God got angry with him and God killed him. But then comes the younger son and Judah told her, wait till this boy grows up. And when he grew up, Judah didn't make good on his promise. So Tamar, she disguised herself as a prostitute and went in to her father-in-law, Judah. And yet the child, Perez, who ends up in the genealogical line of Jesus is a child of incest. Why is that left in the Bible? Because somebody listening at me now, here you are thinking that the circumstances of your birth disqualifies you from being used by God. But God says it did not disqualify Jesus from being the savior of the world. And you ought to tell somebody it doesn't matter what circumstances you were born under. You are not under a curse. You can identify with Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. You read on down, Perez begot Ezra, and Ezra begot Aram, and Aram begot Abinadad, and Abinadad begot Nason, and Nason begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz of Rashab. Now, you know who Rashab is? This is the one recorded in the book of Joshua that hid the spies. Huh? And you know what her reputation and what her business was. She was a harlot. 
Don't let the devil tell you that because of how you wasted your life, selling your very body, that now God can't use you. I want you to know that Rahab, she was a professional prostitute and ended up in the genealogical line of Jesus Christ. I gotta go just a little bit further. Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. <laughs> you trace out the genealogy of the Moabites and you'll find out that God did not like their beginning so he forbade them up to that 10th generation to even come into the temple. But the fact still remains that Ruth the Moabite got into the Lord's genealogical line. Oh, I know that all of you who have tremendous pedigree, this doesn't bless you. But there's some people in here that it's blessing. Amen. Find that when you get to verse 6, Jesse begot David, the king. And David the king begot Solomon of her that had been Uriah's wife. Out of all of David's children, God put Solomon, the one who was Bathsheba's son. Oh, not the first son because that son died. But after God allowed that son to die, as a judgment against David and Bathsheba, she conceived again. And Solomon became the wisest man of the East. And although he was the son of David and Bathsheba, he ends up in the genealogical line of Jesus Christ. So I hope you understand where I'm coming from now. God gave him a body that was designed to save you, and you, and you, and me. You can't be so bad that you're beneath his reaching. Somebody said Jesus will pick you up <laughs> if it has to reach. Oh, I don't care what you say. He had to go way down to get some of us. Down in the pit. Down in the gutter, yeah. down in the mess yeah. that we wouldn't even want to admit today. Yeah. But thank God that he put on a body of flesh. Oh, hallelujah. I'm getting ready to close this. But that's what Bethlehem was about. Matthew tells us about his genealogy. Luke tells us about his genealogy. But John takes the heavenly view. So, oh, I know that when you're looking from earth's side, you see him as Mary's little baby. But when you look from heaven's side, he is really the word made flesh, coming to dwell a tabernacle among men, when you look at it from heaven's side, the writer of Hebrews says that God is looking down and he is looking at the temporary measure that he has instituted to atone for man's sin. And that is the offering up of a bull, a goat, a heifer, some animal that has been selected Without a blemish, that animal becomes an offering for the sins of the people. But it is only potent for one year. The priest would have to go behind the veil of the Holy of Holies. Every year on the great day of atonement. And on that day he would offer up a sacrifice that would atone and appease the wrath of God for one year. But because that animal could not make anything holy, 
Next year, the high priest had an appointment at the same time to do the same thing. But when the word, the pre-incarnate word that is always at the right hand of the Father looked over and saw the displeasure in the face of the Father. He said, burn offerings and sacrifices for sin thou have had no pleasure. But if you just prepare me a body, I'll go down and I'll do what the goats and the lambs cannot do. Finally, one morning, before the break of day, shepherds were out there watching over their flock by night. And all of a sudden, an angel appeared. And there's something about it, I told you, people try to make you think an angel is some little dainty cutie pie. But an angel is an awesome creature that whenever he appears, men have terror struck to their heart. When these shepherds saw him, they fell backwards for fear. But I hear him say, fear not. I want you to know the body has been prepared. Under you is born this day in the city of David a savior which is Christ the Lord and this will be a sign unto you you'll find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger and when the shepherds got there they found Mary and Joseph with the little infant baby newborn baby that had just been born that night wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Hey, glory. Hallelujah. But at the same time that the shepherds were telling the shepherds, or rather the angel was telling the shepherds out east about six or seven hundred miles a star appeared and the wise men saw the star. They said, what's going on? Something's happening. We've never seen that star before. We experienced astronomers. We are astrologers. We search the heavens, but we've never seen that star. They said, that means something great is going on. Let's follow the star and see where it leads. It took them several months, close to two years, before they got to Bethlehem. And by the time they got there, the imperial census was over. Everybody who had rushed into Bethlehem for the sake of Caesar's census taken, they had now gone home. There was room in the inn. There was room with their relatives. Mary, Joseph, and Jesus had moved out of the stable and had moved into the house. And when the wise men came to the house, I have to go through that because I heard somebody the other night on television talking about Luke and Matthew disagree that Luke said he was born in a stable and Matthew said he was born in a house. No, 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 no. Matthew tells me what happened. Months later, by this time, he was no longer just an arm baby, but they were in the house. And those wise men, they came in and brought their gifts, gold, to celebrate his kingliness. For in that day, in the Orient where they came from, it was the custom to take a new baby of royalty, put him on one side of the balancing scale, and put gold on the other side until the weight of the baby balanced the weight of the gold. Hence they could say he's worth his weight in gold. So one group brought their gold, another one brought frankincense, French incense, incense to be offered up 
burning on the altar, recognizing that not only is he a king, but he is a high priest. So they brought him frankincense. Then the other one had to admit one day this same body is going to have to go to Calvary and be hung up for our hang-ups. So they brought myrrh. So when he died, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they were going to mix up a solution of myrrh and aloes in order to rub down his dead body. So the wise men were wise enough to know he was a king, wise enough to know he was a priest, and wise enough to know he had to die. Oh, glory. Hallelujah. So the body was complete. The body that was made up of proper DNA. The body that had in its ancestry. It had in it, oh my God, a prostitute. It had in it Moabites and Canaanites. It had in it everything that you would say shouldn't be there. But God say it's necessary. If I'm gonna redeem the drug addict and the prostitute, if I'm gonna redeem the murderer and the fornicator, if I'm gonna redeem every man born in the earth, I've got to prepare a special body. Woo. Oh, let me close. When the angel, bless your Reverend Neil, when the angel realized that heaven's plan had come together, one angel popped out in space and spoke to the shepherds, under you is born this day in the city of David, a savior which is Christ the Lord. But suddenly, Heaven couldn't contain the news. Heaven the choir recessed in heaven and took up above the earth. And they sang glory to God in the highest on earth. Peace and goodwill to men. And I just got to tell the United Nations there will not be any peace until Jesus sits at the peace conference. There will not be any peace until men of every race, creed and color will bow down on their knees and say Jesus is Lord. Then and only then will we have peace on earth. But I just want to tell you that although the noise of war is all over this world, in this world there is confusion. But I hear Jesus say in me there is peace. Trouble in the streets, but I got peace in my heart. Trouble in the land, but I got peace in my mind. When I was a youngster growing up, they used to sing, he is mine, he is mine. I got joy in my soul, I got peace in my mind. He is mine, Jesus I know, he is mine. You ought to reach over and tell somebody, Jesus is mine. I got joy, I got peace, I got salvation because he's mine. Whoa. I'm closing.
something. But I'm glad I know what this day is all about. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with the Christmas tree. Everybody who want to decorate the tree, help yourself. But that ain't my thing. Everybody that want to go and charge your credit card to the limit, spending money you don't have to impress people that you don't even like, you can have it. That ain't my thing. And you saints, I think y'all be shaming yourself. Telling your children about Santa Claus with flying reindeer. Big fat white man from the North Pole. Squeezing down your chimney with a sack on his back. If that's your thing, go with it. But to me, it's all about a body. That was made out of flesh so that he could feel what I feel. So that he could walk where I walk. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. So that he could be tempted like I'm tempted. And yet did no sin. Neither was any guile found in his mouth. And I thank God. He was a baby, but he didn't stay a baby. By the time he got 12 years old, I don't know where the mythological writers of Superman got the idea. But in reality, that's what happened with Jesus. The mythological Superman came from a planet, Krypton that supposedly blew up and yet his father made a space vessel for this little baby to come to earth and in that space vessel he put some light tubes and those light tubes uh, were the equivalent of your computer data that's on the floppy disk and when the little boy grew up and wanted to know who he was and where he got all this super strength from he had to go to this place on the North Pole and put those little tubes and relive his history see who he was where he came from and what his purpose was Oh, that's a myth with Superman. But when this little boy, Jesus, grew up, knowing that something about heaven kept him looking up, he went to the temple, and that was the only place where something would feed him. And after Mary and Joseph and the rest of the family in that second chapter of Luke, had spent the required days at the feast. They went home. But Jesus was left behind in the temple talking to the doctors of the law, hearing them and asking them questions. Oh my God. By the time he got 30, he knew all he wanted to know. He knew all he needed to know. And he went down to the Jordan River and said, all right, John, time has come now. Baptize me. John said, no, no, no. Uh Uh-uh, I have need to be baptized of you. But Jesus said, suffer it, John, because it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. And coming up straightway, 
out of the water. The Holy Ghost descended on him in the bodily shape of a dove. And the father confirmed his suspicions and said, oh yeah, you it. This is my beloved son. And in you I'm well pleased. And he went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Forty days, forty nights, fasting and praying. And every time the devil came against him, he didn't do nothing but take a verse out of Deuteronomy and whip the devil with it. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. But when he returned from the wilderness, the Bible said he returned in the power of the spirits and demons were in trouble. Sick folk couldn't be in his presence. Dead folk couldn't stay dead. If he got around dead folk, they came to life. If he got around sick folk, they were healed. And everybody now don't know who he is. Got some folk, they'll go to the cradle, but they'll go no further than the cradle. I was scanning the television last night, early this morning. They got, it's a wonderful life. They got the story of the bishop's wife. They got all these other stories, but not one about the life of Christ on what is supposed to be his birthday. The world don't know him. The world think he just came to spread good cheer. So people would spend money and exchange gifts. But I want you to know he came that you don't have to be a sinner no longer. Everybody standing.